they're not going to want to sell right when you call them, right? They're, you're kind of caught them off guard, but it's getting the details on the property, seeing how it's performing, and then following up with them because life happens. If, if this cold calling has taught me anything, it's that, hey, you know, people are one heart attack away from fire selling their property. It's all right. timing and being there when, you know, something happens to help give them a solution, right? A, a fast exit uh, because that's that matters in today's world. Welcome to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Show. Whether you are an active or passive investor, we'll teach you how to scale your real estate investing business into something big. Andrew Keel is the CEO of Keel Team LLC, an MHU top 100 owner of manufactured housing communities with over 2,000 lots under management. His team currently manages over 30 manufactured housing communities and 11 self-storage facilities. Andrew, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here, Sam. Absolutely. The pleasure is mine, Andrew. There are three questions I ask every guest who comes on the show in 90 seconds or less. Can you tell me where did you start, where are you now, and how did you get there? Started flipping houses around Central Florida. Uh, through a yellow letter I mailed out, I found two mobile homes uh, uh, that, that I ended up buying and selling on contract. Ended up meeting a, a park owner. And he took me under his wing and, and said, hey, this is how you syndicate deals and raise money from investors. So now I've been doing that for seven years and we own uh, over 2000 lots across 33 mobile home parks and 11 self-storage facilities. Wow, that's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. Tell me, I guess, what uh, what's the market sentiment and what it is you're doing right now? The market sentiment, you know, I think it's, uh, I think there's some some ups and downs, you know, there's some there's some landlords out there that have kind of given mobile home park investing a black eye, I would say, from you know raising rents too fast and 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 kind of you know predatory landlording is is kind of you know going around. So there's some of that out there, uh, but then there's good operators that are doing it the right way, right? Like you know rents got to go up, but you got to fix that deferred maintenance. So you got to improve the properties and make them better. And I think there's a win-win there for the tenants and for the investors. So uh, it's just finding the right operators, yeah. No, that that's absolutely right. Uh, I want to hear, you know, what what it is that you guys are doing right now. Uh, like, who is your target seller? What what's that? What's that look like for you? Target seller is uh, we have a, an acronym. It's called GOAT, and it stands for Gray Old and Tired. <laughs> and in our CRM, we don't pursue any deals unless the owner is a gray old and tired. Uh, owner of commercial real estate, specifically mobile home parks and self-storage facilities. Uh, through our sales team, we make over a quarter of a million cold calls to mom and pop owners of uh, self-storage and uh, mobile home parks every year. And that's where we buy all of our deals are, are off market, uh, direct to owner. And, you know, we've just found that, you know, when we're buying from mom and pops, we're able to get, you know, uh, typically better deals, but mainly we're buying properties that are not being efficiently run. And when we take them over, you know, there's very easy to see things like, hey, having your rent roll be digital and software instead of on a yellow pad of paper. Little things that we can do to tweak the operations to make it better. And hey, if that's how they're running the rent roll, imagine what else they're doing that we could tweak to more efficiently and, and increase the NOI. So yeah, that's that's our nutshell. Yeah, and and I think anytime, and of course the the manufactured housing community space, even for the last decade, has certainly been undergoing its fair share of sophisticated ownership groups. Uh, in fact, I yeah. would say it's probably more on that front than maybe less at this stage because it's it's been such a hot uh, a hot um, asset class to be buying in. But tell me some more other efficiencies maybe that you guys see some sophistications that you can bring to the table at scale, maybe that a mom and pop owner just can't afford to do with a single property. Yeah, I mean, the big one that comes to mind is sub metering the uh, water and the water usage, right? The under each home, you know, now there's technology out there with internet connections, the sub meters actually have internet connection and will in real time notify you of high usage. So if they go over, uh, you know, high usage, we can stop it right, you know, very early on instead of waiting 30 days for us to get a, a, a an invoice in the mail from the water company telling us that we have a water leak because our water bill is double. You know, right. we're able to just react in real time where the mom and pops, they may not even be billing back 
for the water and sewer. They may just be including that in lot rent. So not only are we billing it back, but we're also catching leaks earlier to you know reduce that potential expense. Yeah, and it's small stuff like that. I mean, I don't know what what do those meters cost you on a on a per home basis. Let's say five hundred bucks all in with installation. Okay, but okay, so five hundred bucks. Let's assume it's a hundred pad, a uh, hundred hundred pad park. That's fifty grand, right? And so that's to, right to a mom and pop owner. That's a tough pill to swallow. Like, man, you know, I don't that's know. If we, we run this park, and that's fifty thousand dollars, and you know, he probably had, had had a new truck in 10 years. So, you know, he's looking at a new truck or back billing water and goes, I think I'll just take the new truck. Uh, Cause you know, if he has to choose how to spend his money where you look at that and say, how can we not put that amount of money into these parks? It just, it just makes financial sense. Like for example, a park we bought, it had water leaks and it was losing $2,000 a month on the water sewer recapture. Wow. So if you take 2000 a month, you times that by 12 months, gives you 24 K a year year in additional expense, if you're able to, you know, add 24 K in NOI to that property, and then at a seven cap, you know, you just saved $342,000 over $342,000. So to spend 50 K to make 342,000, we're going to do that every day of the week. For sure. For sure. You call me when you have that next, uh, next, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> opportunity right there. If I can do that in a year, I'll, I'll, I'll be, all, I'll be all about it. Thanks, Andrew. Um, no, that's fantastic. I love that. I love that. Let's get into the, the, the 250,000 cold calls comment. I mean, that's mind boggling. Are there 250,000 self storage and or mobile home? Are there, are there that many combined in the United States? That, there's not. Yeah. There's about 50,000 or so of each asset class. Okay. And obviously, you know, for mobile home parks, that number is going down every year because right. it's really hard to get new ones developed and the existing ones are being torn down and right. turned into apartments or, or something else. Uh, you know, for self storage is obviously being built up, you know, uh, more and more, but uh, you know, a lot of that is recurring calls, you know, they don't pick up, you know, you're leaving voicemails, you're doing different things, but but yeah, I think that is our niche. And, you know, for example, we have a $4 million property under contract right now that's supposed to close at the end of the month, 100% owner financing at wow. 6% and a seven-year term and 25-year amortization. Okay. So like 100% LTV, you know, and do your return metrics on that when all of the capital you're raising is for improvements. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. That's amazing. It's and people, awesome. people will tell you that those deals don't exist, but you're, you're living proof that, that, that they do in fact still exist. What's it, what's it been like? Give us some insight onto building a cold calling team and even getting the deal flow and data right such that that team can then continue to produce those phone calls. I mean, that's, that's a whole process all yeah. in itself. Oh, it a hundred percent is. Yeah. We used a, a software called Reonomy to help identify property owners and get their contact information. And then, you know, really identifying the team, you know, we found that it's better to get sales guys that can work part-time because doing eight hours straight of just cold calling, you're going to lose energy and you're going to, by the end of it, you're not going to be as productive. So we have uh, a team that works part-time, you know, four hours a day, right in the mornings typically. And, you know, they're on a dialer. So they're hitting, you know, multiple numbers at once, you know, reaching out to people. And, and it's been really productive for us, you know, building those relationships, you know, hey, they, they're not going to want to sell right when you call them, right? They're, you're kind of caught them off guard, but it's getting the details on the property, seeing how it's performing, and then following up with them because life happens. If, if this cold calling has taught me anything, it's that, hey, you know, people are one heart attack away from fire sailing their property. It's all right. timing and being there when, you know, something happens to help give them a solution, right? A, a fast exit uh, because that's, that matters in today's world. It, it certainly does. And I was the unfortunate recipient of some news on some deals we'd been chasing a couple of years ago. And, uh, you know, the seller at that point was just hard and fast. No, 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 not going to do it. And then, uh, I found out today that all the whole portfolio had traded hands and I'm like, it's my mm. own fault for not staying in front of them. Right. I mean, it's my own fault. Those are lessons learned the hard way where you just go, okay, you've got to, like you said, it's one heart attack away from suddenly going, Hey, we're going to fire sale this. You know, I got yeah. three months left to live maybe, and I don't really care anymore. So somebody buy it so I can go do what I want for the next 90 days. 
Uh, yeah, and right now, you know, with what's going on with all, all these uh, interest rate caps that people are buying, and and what happened with these variable rate loans, you know, I think I think there's more and more forced sellers than there are, uh, you know, people that that would desire to sell, you know, at at the right time. So there might be some opportunity there. Do you think it's happened? Because it's certainly I've seen it happen in the. Um, multifamily space. I hadn't really heard or thought much about it in the manufactured housing or community uh, space. People taking on bridge debt, bridge debt is now coming due. They need a refi, but they can't because it doesn't make sense. They're, they're doing cash in refis. I mean, are you guys seeing that in your, in your uh, asset class as well? Not a ton of it. You know, I think it's still early, even for multifamily, you know, I think it's still early. But there were some operators out there that took variable rate loans and now are negative cash flow. And I mean, I've seen it, right? These CMBS lenders are vicious. They will take your property back. They want to take your property back. Right. So it's really, you know, a matter of time before we see blood in the streets. Yeah. Yeah. That's unfortunate. Yeah. And that's, uh, and again, you know, I haven't seen it a lot in the multifamily space, but certainly have heard the rumblings and have, uh, you know, talked to some lenders and people that have indicated that they're that they are seeing that uh indeed occur on the especially on the cash in refi side on on multifamily properties which has got to be a painful situation oh. uh for everyone uh especially, everyone especially your investor base um so yes. yeah that's uh let's talk about the affordable housing crisis i mean it's something you know we hear that those three words put together all the time and you're in a space that is like you said it's it's a it's not just a constraint but it's a dwindling supply space. So what are you guys doing on that front to preserve and or create more affordable housing? Yeah, great question. I love talking about this because, you know, this is the win-win, right? You know, we're, we're buying these properties from mom and pops who have let things kind of dwindle, right? Like we're buying properties that are 70% occupied, you know, so there's, there's more lots sitting there, but the mom and pops just don't have the effort or like you said, the, the funds to go and buy homes, bring them in and set them up on those lots. Right. So when we're able to rejuvenate a property and come in with a lot of energy and a lot of new capital, it, it just, it, it is so awesome. That is why I love doing this business because I'm able to see lives change. I'm able to add affordable housing units to markets that desperately need it. And at the same time, I'm able to create a win for our investors because they're able to get great returns on their investment and also get great tax benefits because of these these mobile home parks but i think you know still the majority of mobile home parks like over 60% are still owned by mom and pops mm -hmm. and they've just kind of used these things as a retirement vehicle and haven't reinvested into them so uh, that vacant lot scenario is where we're adding affordable housing units and you know the, the high level econ 101 is like hey the supply of mobile home parks are shrinking every year that's like a known just type in you know, mobile home parks uh, shutting down into Google and see what pops up. It's it's all over the news because uh, deferred maintenance, because redevelopment, you know, you name it. And we're able to buy these properties and keep them mobile home parks and increase the occupancy so that we're adding affordable housing. And and that just matters. That, that matters because we desperately need it. Manufactured housing can be built for around $50 a square foot, where site-built housing is over $100 a square foot. So it's like, there's a huge win here uh, to be had. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to be able to add to that supply. Tell me about, tell me about um, maybe community engagement inside of your uh, communities. What's something you guys are doing on that front? Obviously retention of your um, residents is probably a lot easier in your space, but are there things that you're doing to really improve the, um, just kind of the holistic experience of someone living in your communities. Yeah, I think the first thing is we always have an on-site manager mm. that to, is is a tenant that lives in our park, you know, and and just giving them that point of contact really makes it feel you know more like a community because they connect everybody, they're talking with everybody. Uh, that has been huge. You know, we're we're buying from mom and pops who have self-managed, yeah. and maybe they live a couple hours away and they don't make it to the pro property, uh, you know, every month where an on-site manager that's working, even if they are part-time, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you know, you know, whatever the, the hours are, but it's just good to have someone there that they can talk to and they can work through stuff and see the options. You know, we noticed that in, in during COVID, you know, there was a ton of rental assistance programs, but there was no one to like hold the, the hand of the tenants and help get them signed up for these. So our on-site managers 
really carried that load and, and sat down on the computers and helped, helped our tenants sign up for these rental assistance programs. And, you know, that is a huge burden off of their back. Now they can spend the money that they have on food and other resources instead of needing to worry, you know, they got thousands of dollars for their rental assistance. And that was just a huge help. So having on-site managers and then obviously communicating well with our, with our resident base is, is huge for us. So those are two things community engagement wise uh, that we make sure to do every year. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's really, really cool. Thanks. Thanks for sharing the insight on that. Yeah. And having that local, that person that's right there living one of your neighbors. I mean, I think that would be just a huge, um, just a huge thing that would really, you know, again, not just resonant retention, but, but from a, a uh, feeling like you belong there sort of thing would, would make a big, yeah. a big difference on that front. You mentioned bringing homes in. So you buy a park, use the example, you said it's 70% occupied. That means let's call it a hundred. I don't know how many units was there, but let's just make a number up and say it's a hundred. So you got 30 sure. open slots. You're going to bring houses in. Are you guys then selling those to your residents? Are you using those as park owned homes? What is that? What's your plan there? Our plan is, is we want tenant owned home communities. Yeah. It's just more scalable and, and we're, we want to rent out the dirt, not the homes themselves. Right. You know, a lot of people don't, don't think about this, but manufactured homes are built differently. The drywall is not the same size, that the windows are different sizes, the doors are different sizes. You can't just go down to the Home Depot and get some of these materials. So you're going to have to special order them and, and ship them in. And, you know, with the logistics issues we've had the past couple of years, that can get expensive. So we don't want to own the homes. We want our tenants to own the homes and we will sell them uh, sometimes via like a, a lease option or, mm-hmm. a, you know, a, a rent credit program where they will make monthly installments towards purchasing the home. Uh, but mostly, uh, you know, there's financing companies out there as well, like Triad and Pep Lending that will finance our tenants and then we will just, you know, get law rent. Got it. Got it. So you guys aren't even directly buying the homes. You're just connecting the buyers with the uh, manufactured housing uh manufacturers. Is that right? Or are you guys buying them, bringing them in and then connecting them? Sometimes, but you know, everybody likes it with the bow on top and ready to go. So we'll, we'll actually get the homes in and there's a program called cash program at 21st uh, mortgage where we'll buy the homes or we won't even have to buy the homes. We'll get the homes moved in, get them set up on the lot and then we'll market them and then, you know, funnel uh, interested buyers to this 21st mortgage, who's a part of Berkshire Hathaway and that whole uh, you know, Clayton Holmes, you know, Warren Buffett deal, right. and they will finance our tenants. Got it. Oh, that's cool. I like that. I like the way you put that with everybody wants it with a bow on top. Cause that's, that's absolutely true. I know here. And again, I haven't had, uh, we haven't talked mobile home parks on this show, probably uh, maybe six, seven months. So I know the last time someone came on and really dove deep into the mobile home park space, even then they were experiencing just some supply chain constraints as it pertained to getting new homes, getting things on the lots. Has any of that lessened or what's that look like now? Yes, it has lessened. You know, it, it was 18 months to you order a home and it wasn't come in for 18 months. It was crazy wow. back in COVID and all the, you know, the logistics issues. Uh, but now we're down to about four months. Okay. So we'll order it and four months it's coming in, which is amazing. I mean, I'm, you know, uh, very grateful for that because 18 months was just so hard. And then they, they wouldn't tell you it was 18 months, right? They'd tell you it was going to be 12 months right. and then they push it back and then they push it back. And then it ended up being 18 months. So imagine your pro forma when you're planning on income at, at month 13 and you're not getting it until month 19. So there was a lot of operators hurting at that time, but things have improved on that front. Oh, that's great. That's great. I'm glad to, glad to hear that. Yeah. That's one of those things that, uh, like you said, if it's, if it's, you can't, you can't underwrite, you know, when, when timelines aren't kept from your manufacturers, you just can't, you can't stick to it. Tell me about this. You've built a team. You've, you've gone from, I think you started in fix and flip. Is that right? If I'm remembering your story correctly, then the beginning yep. started fix and flipping, yep. now you've grown this, this huge mobile home park uh, or mobile home community business. You've got team members, you've got cold callers working all day. You guys are selling homes, you're buying <laughs> communities. I mean, you're going like gangbusters. What is one thing you feel like you've done really well? that maybe somebody that's just starting out and or you know has a little traction should emulate hiring overseas hiring overseas and siloing off you know tasks and then documenting really well if i was gonna you know do it all over again i would have done that earlier you know you can hire more loyal and uh you know less expensive help overseas that will be will be just 
fully capable and then some to execute. And, you know, if you can do that, I really think every business owner should really explore hiring some overseas help. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. When it comes to things that maybe rewind the tape a little bit and, you know, you said, gosh, I could have done this better. What are, what are some of those things that come to mind? Yeah, man, I, uh, in my early days, you know, when we were just hiring us based people, uh, we didn't do like a personality assessment or anything like that to see if they would actually be good in their role, uh, long-term. So we had a lot of turnover, uh, because it was, Hey, we, we put someone that was not detail oriented in a role that required, you know, very detail oriented, uh, personality types. So now we use a system called the predictive index mm -hmm. and it does a, a cognitive and a personality assessment. And it's just aligned our team with the roles and we're, we're finding they're staying longer. They're happier, you know, because we're playing to their strengths. So that's been huge for us. Yeah, man. What a powerful thing that is. I can, I can just speak uh, and completely agree with you on that front using a personality assessment I'm familiar with predictive, predictive index, the disc test, a lot of those, uh, you know, maybe one, one, I don't know if one's necessarily better than the other, but I've used them both. And uh, gosh, I was even having a conversation with a new hire yesterday when I was like, wait, I can refer back to your um, personality test that you took. And I recognize that I need to speak to you and engage with you in a different way such that you understand what it is I'm trying to say and, and give you what you need to go do your job. And, exactly. Uh, and I think it's so powerful. It's so powerful. So and actually, powerful. And actually, this there was a team member that we just into this the same team member we just brought on. But I had a role. I wanted to hire this particular, I wanted to fill this role. And I already knew this person. I wanted to put her in that role. She did the personality test and I said, No, but there's another kind of blended role that we can put you in that will do a little bit of those things, but fill the gap over here much more meaningfully based on your skill set. She's way happier and she's crushing it. It's like, that's so, yeah. awesome. No, it is awesome. So I just think, thanks for sharing that. Cause I think if people aren't utilizing those very, and they're not expensive. I no, mean, they're not. No. And it makes all the difference in the world. So I can just testify to what you've just said as a, as a leader, um, how powerful that is when we're building out uh, our teams on that front. So very, very cool. You've shared with us so much here today, Andrew, on how to build a team talking about, you know, making 250, which is an astounding number, thousand cold calls, how you guys are buying, you're buying everything offline, buying from, from, uh, you know, mom and pops, how you're bringing sophistication to the industry in the space. We didn't even get to talk about self storage. I mean, you guys are buying in, in, in that department too. Maybe you'll have to come back on show number two and tell us how you're, how you guys are finding opportunity on that front. Is there anything else really that comes to mind today that you'd say, man, Sam, these are some things that I really want to share with your listeners that are relevant to what we're doing and that uh, I think will make a difference. Yeah, I would say at, at the end of the day, uh, you know, being willing to uh, give back and, and try to create win-wins, you know, in, in your business, right? Like, uh, our, our goal is not to make as much money as we humanly can, right? At the end of the day, it's creating a win-win for our residents. Mm -hmm. So they're happy. And by doing that, they're going to stay longer and it's going to be a win for our investors because they're going to have more reliable, uh, income and, and, you know, income and distributions off of their investment. So that's, that's something I can go to bed at night and lay my head down knowing, Hey, I'm doing, I'm doing good in the world. I'm adding affordable housing and I'm, I'm, you know, keeping these assets as mobile home parks, and in, in my case, uh, where otherwise they might have been redeveloped and, and turned into something else, and these people would have lost uh, lost their homes and lost their living arrangements. So, uh, yeah, I'll just spin that way. Awesome, Andrew. Thank you for coming on the show today. I do appreciate it. Certainly learned a lot from you. If our listeners want to get in touch with you and learn more about you, what is the best way to do that? Best way to do that would be to check out my website. It's keelteam.com. That's just K-E-E-L-T-E-A-M.com. Keelteam.com. We'll make sure we put that there in the show notes. Andrew, thank you again. Have a great rest of your day. Yeah, thank you so much, Sam. Hey, thanks for listening to the How to Scale Commercial Real Estate Podcast. If you can do me a favor and subscribe and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, whatever platform it is you use to listen 
If you can do that for us, that would be a fantastic help to the show. It helps us both attract new listeners as well as rank higher on those directories. So appreciate you listening. Thanks so much and hope to catch you on the next episode.